Thank you again for joining us today. I'm Melissa Raid. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Sustain Life. And today's webinar is how to calculate your company's carbon footprints. If you're here in the room or across the screen from us, you are probably looking for information on how to put together a carbon inventory for your company's organizational boundary. And we're going to spend the time today talking about what that means, a little bit of ins and outs of carbon accounting, and some framing around, around how we're helping companies today meet their carbon disclosure needs. So let's kick it off. For those that are not familiar with Sustain Life, thanks so much for joining us today. We're a leading supply chain decarbonization SaaS platform that helps companies future-proof themselves by fighting climate change. And that's something that we're really proud of. So most of the time, the way that we're working with companies is helping them calculate their carbon footprint, set a science-based target, and simplify climate disclosures. So whether you're looking to report to CDP or do something aligned with TCFD or meet mandated regulated disclosure, that's a lot of who we're working with today, both those that are regulated themselves by these mandates, as well as those that are value chain companies and fall within the supply chains of these companies and are essentially being asked by their most important customers to disclose and allocate their emissions. So today we're gonna to focus on context and education and simplifying carbon accounting. For those that are looking for clear and simple tools that deliver emissions inventories for your business, I do encourage you to book a demo on our site. But what we're really gonna be talking about today is kind of that educational upskilling and just simplification so that you on the other side of the line here, whether you're a sustainability professional with deep expertise, whether you're perhaps new to sustainability but have been tasked by your company to figure it out and get the carbon uh, emissions inventory together, we really want to walk through what does this mean and provide a lot of foundational context so that you can feel confident and secure leading this work for your organization. So why are emissions a top priority, right? We're going to kick off the agenda with just a little bit of framing and a little bit of landscape framing on the regulatory side, as well as that supply chain network effect I spoke about. We are going to go through a carbon accounting primer, and this is really the fun part. We're going to really understand where do these numbers come from? Why do we call it carbon accounting? How does all the math work out? So again, really to build up your confidence and understanding of all the stuff that all the fancy algorithms and computer models that we're doing in the background for you. You know, carbon literacy is really important for any business to understand, especially now that, you know, with these mandated disclosures, it's just higher stakes. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of case studies and who we're helping. And then, of course, we will save some time, as always, for Q&A. I will ask that if you have any questions, please do use the Q&A function. And I will check those at the end, and we'll get through as many as we can. All right, so let's kick it off. What's driving emissions disclosure and emissions measurement today? So we're going to focus a lot on regulation. But the really important thing to know about regulation is that it's actually simultaneously driving a concurrent supply chain effect so that even companies that aren't directly themselves regulated, because so many of these mandates include the disclosure of what's called a scope three emission, and we'll get into that, it's essentially meaning that companies in the supply chain of large um, businesses need to disclose their emissions to their customers while not a government or regulating agency. So let's talk about this a little bit. There seems to be almost a deluge of climate-related disclosure across global jurisdictions today. So we'll start in the U.S. That's where I'm based. That's where we're based. But we have here the proposed SEC rule, which is actually the Enhancement and Standardization of Climate-Related Disclosure. And that's essentially aligned with the TCFD, the Task Force, the task force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. And that, of course, is acting companies to disclose their material climate-related risks and opportunities as well as their greenhouse gas emissions and any decarbonization target that they've set, and then to report on progress towards that target. Then we look, well, we'll go next to California. California landmark rule, hot off the presses, California's SB 253 bill is also requiring any public or private company, a U.S.-based company, that has over a billion dollars in revenue and does business in the state of California to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. If we look across, and, that, and that's a really big deal. This is the first state to actually kind of beat uh, the federal law in the U.S. where that SEC law is still proposed. It's not quite finalized. And so I think we'll you know, see um, perhaps other states follow suit. California often leads the charge on these things. 
Um, if we look across the pond, we have the EU CSRD, which is officially adopted. Its reporting period starts in 2024. And that's actually a much broader requirement for sustainability reporting and disclosure across all ESNG topics predicated on double materiality. And part of that includes, as one small part, of course, emissions. And then, of course, we have the ISSB or IFRS S2, which is not a mandate, but is a global framework that is meant to harmonize climate and broader sustainability disclosure. And that, of course, requires emissions disclosure. And so without getting too caught up in the alphabet soup, not just the frameworks, but now actually the regulations and the laws, what's really important for us to see here at a high level is that the regulation is here. It often starts with large companies or publicly listed companies, but we're seeing it across global jurisdictions. And so these large enterprises are mandated to disclose their emissions across scopes one, two, and oftentimes three. And the inclusion of that scope three figure is what drives supply chain engagement. And so if you're a smaller or mid-sized business where you're not public, you're not publicly listed, you're not a large enterprise with over a billion dollars in revenue, you actually could be facing very similar pressures to measure and disclose your own emissions, not to a regulator, but to your most important customers that are driving that decarbonization through their supply chain and require themselves to actually report on their scope three emissions, which of course is your emissions. So that's just a little bit of, of context on what's going on on the regulatory side and some of those supply chain private pressures. And so where are companies today? You know, we included these three bullets here, and this is so many of the companies that we speak to. This is how they're feeling. They are very overwhelmed. This is a very nascent and quickly evolving space. They don't know where to start, and they frankly don't have the time or the resources to get that stable footing and figure out the whole landscape and nuance of what is carbon accounting? How am I supposed to approach this for my business? What's material? When can I estimate? When can I use proxy information? When do I need primary information? Um, carbon accounting is not rocket science, um, but it is nuanced and it is complex. And so that's what we're here to do today is to simplify that and demystify that and build some of that confidence and security so that you, the stakeholders and folks on the other side of the line can go and, and do this for your companies with confidence and select the right tools and support systems to help you get your emissions inventory in place. So I do wanna speak a little bit on just the that dynamic I was speaking about with the enterprise and the suppliers. And this is a lot of, frankly, the, the stakeholders that we speak with fall on two sides of this coin. And so on the enterprise side, this is where you have those larger, often publicly listed, but not always, companies that are um, looking to disclose their emissions either because they're mandated to do so or because they have significant investor pressure and it's something that they've either been doing for some time and now need to really anchor and do in a more automated, grounded way with better data governance. And so some of the things that they're looking for is standardized data collection, those scope three emissions and actual ability to decarbonize and bring those emissions down, engage with their suppliers and help enable them to reduce their impact. And then, of course, because this is often auditable records, and that's really important, and that's, in my somewhat biased opinion, that's where we think technology is such a great solution here, because you're able to have um, one system of record, you have an audit trail, you have integrations and automatic data uploads, and, and it's a really important opportunity for companies to really ground their emissions in integrity for that financial greed public disclosure. And so what we're talking about on the enterprise side, it's often companies that are mature or sophisticated or at least have sophisticated needs. And there's a little bit of a chasm or a disconnect between those companies and the suppliers where they're asking for this information specifically for those scope three emissions. And so on the supplier side, so often the companies that we speak to, they are looking for simplified measurement tools that take a lot of the technical confusion out of it and allow them to speak the language of their business. So we'll talk a little bit about the greenhouse gas protocol. It is the gold standard of carbon accounting. It's the rule book that we all follow and it's complex. And so what we've done at Sustain Life and what a lot of mid-market and SME companies most appreciate is really simplifying that guidance and that technical requirements into business activities that you understand, right? How much energy are you consuming? How much waste are you generating? What are you purchasing? We don't have to talk within the uh, greenhouse gas protocol categories and scopes, although we are gonna talk about them a little bit today to kind of set that stage so, so everyone can understand how they all connect to those business activities. And so that's just a little bit of what we do at Sustain Life. 
We help companies without the deep expertise or frankly the Fortune 500 budgets to take meaningful climate action. And we, we anchor on three key pillars and we talk about doing this in three key ways. And the first one is measure. And that's carbon emissions. That's the bulk of what we'll talk about today, but also the environmental impact from internal operations and supply chain operations, both on the environmental side, but also across broader sustainability and ESG. Second is manage, and this is a really important one, right? The operational impact across areas like energy, water, waste, so that you can overall reduce your business footprint. We also like to help companies highlight opportunities of how they can better manage ESG-related risks and opportunities. And that can be everything from physically protecting assets from increased extreme weather events to something more of a transitional risk like volatile energy and carbon markets. And then, of course, our last pillar is report. And this is one that is getting a lot more airtime these days because of these mandated disclosures and that increased kind of pressure. But the requirements here have really elevated. We're talking about reporting audit grade data, whether that's to customers, investors, employees, or regulators with transparency and integrity. And so those are some of the key points today, transparency and integrity, that we really want to focus on and that we really want to make sure that we can upskill and educate and contextualize all of you to really feel confidence in, in your carbon accounting. So this is the exciting part. Let's get into it. This is the Carbon 101 primer that probably most of you came here today, right? You need to put together a carbon inventory. You don't know where to start. You're trying to wrap your arms around the different emission scopes and the different categories and what data you can use. So let's start by bringing it back to the building blocks, right? We're talking about here emissions accounting. And now this is often used interchangeably with a couple other phrases. You might have heard carbon accounting, carbon emissions, carbon footprint, um, carbon inventory, emissions inventory. And sometimes we just use the, foot, the, the shorthand of carbon. But what we're talking about here is quantifying the amount of greenhouse gases released to the atmosphere from your business. And I'm going to actually break it down even one step further. And this is a little bit of grade school, probably education here, but let's talk about what a greenhouse gas is, right? These are naturally occurring gases in the atmosphere that absorb energy. And the way that the Earth's radiative budget works is that the sun emits energy in the form of heat down to Earth. And a lot of that energy gets absorbed across our biosphere, right? Plants, animals, land, water. But a fair amount of that energy actually bounces off the Earth's surface and reflects back into space. And it's the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that trap that energy and that reflected heat and act like an insulating blanket, keeping the earth warm and habitable. So again, greenhouse gases are naturally occurring. They're what allow us to be habitable here on earth, but they've drastically increased in concentration since the industrial revolution, primarily through the combustion of fossil fuels. And so now that warming effect, that insulating blanket, it's actually getting a little too hot, right? And so with that comes disruption to the critical earth systems that we depend on in terms of how we circulate air or, or heat really through our atmospheric and hydraulic systems on the planet. And so when we think about global warming, we often think about carbon dioxide, right? And carbon, we're always talking about carbon. But that's in fact only one of the several greenhouse gases that exist. And let's just talk about some of these other gases that we have up here on the screen. So we have other greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide. And that's a gas that's released from agriculture, from land use and industrial activities, in addition to, of course, burning fossil fuels. We have methane, CH4, that's released from agriculture and livestock. We often think cows when we think of methane. Methane is also released from coal processing and landfills, as well, of course, the burning of fossil fuels. And then there's a whole nother class of gases called fluorinated gases. And that's what you see on the back half here. And what's important to know about these is these are man-made gases. They're often used in industrial processes and refrigerants. They're kind of nasty. They have these very long chemical names like hydrofluorocarbons and perofluorocarbons. And what the emissions accounting process entails, the reason why we call it carbon accounting, is because it means converting all of these different gases, the methane, the nitrous oxide, the fluorinated gases, to a common single unit of measure carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2E. And that's why we call it accounting, because there's math involved in converting one gas into this CO2E metric so that we have one common unit of measure across which we can compare and talk about activities. So of course, how do we do that, right? What is the math that converts greenhouse gases from its, its initial gas into that CO2E? 
And that is all based on what is called global warming potential. And all global warming potential is, we call it GWP, is it's a measure of energy that is absorbed by a gas over time. And as a result, it's insulating power. So let's walk through a quick example here. Methane, for example. Methane has a global warming potential of 28, which means that one metric ton, or really any unit of methane, but one metric ton of methane has an insulating power 28 times more powerful than that of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is always the base gas. And so that over a 100 year period, one metric ton of methane is actually equal to 28 metric tons uh, of CO2e. And now the fluorinated gases that I spoke about, those refrigerants, they have global warming potentials in the thousands. So that's way more powerful, about powerful than CO2. And so if methane and all these other gases have higher global warming potential than CO2, why are we always talking about CO2 and CO2e? Why is this the common building block of greenhouse gases? And that's because even though methane and all those other gases are actually more powerful insulators, they're also a lot less stable. So their molecular structure is such that they're out in the atmosphere, they're bouncing around with other molecules and atoms, and their chemical, their molecular structure actually changes. And they decompose, they change. They're in the atmosphere for a much shorter period of time compared to CO2. Uh, and just to give you a sense of that, we're talking on the, on the scale of something like decades versus centuries for CO2. And that's why it's all about CO2 in the end is because it's kind of like the bad habit that never goes away. Once it's in the atmosphere, it's there for a very, very, very long time. And that insulating power, while maybe less intense than the methane and the other gases, has a longevity to it that overall makes it the most powerful and critical greenhouse gas. Okay. So that's the math. That's as far as we're going to go. Hopefully that helps kind of illuminate what we're actually doing in carbon accounting. I think so often we talk about CO2 and CO2e and we, we kind of forget about these other constituent gases. And they're really important. If you're a company, for instance, that reports to CDP or some of these other mandated disclosures, they actually do want to know not just your CO2e number, but the, the breakout of your constituent gases because they do have different kinds of impacts on the atmosphere. Okay, so now let's get into the classification of emissions. So at its highest level, we have direct emissions and indirect emissions, two buckets. So direct emissions are emissions from activities that your company directly controls. So just think of this as your company does an activity and that activity, which is often the combustion of a fossil fuel, is directly releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So again, examples are if you're burning heating oil or propane or natural gas, anytime you burn a fuel, that's a direct emission because you're burning it, nobody else is doing it for you, the emissions are out in the atmosphere. Now that's a little bit different than indirect emissions. And these are activities that support your business operation but are technically outside of your control. And these can be broken up into two different categories, upstream and downstream. All upstream means is everything that you purchase or acquire. So that's where a lot of those supply chain emissions come in because those are the goods and services that you as a company are buying to support your primary business. Um, those are examples of upstream emissions. Downstream emissions are anything related to the uh, good or service that you sell. So if you make a physical product and then consumers use that product, let's say it is an electronic device and it needs to be charged every so often, that's a downstream emission, indirect emission, because your company didn't technically release the greenhouse gases into the air, but because you sold a product and it's being used and it's then consuming electricity, there are these indirect emissions that are associated with its use. So that's just a way to think of direct and indirect emissions. Now we're gonna get into the emission scopes. And this is probably one of the most familiar classification systems to everybody on the line. We're always talking about scope one, two, three emissions. And so let's break down what these really are, okay? So we have a shorthand for this at Sustain Life. We call it burn by and beyond. And it's a very helpful little moniker that just helps remember what each scope really represents. So let's talk about scope one, the burn. So scope one emissions are the only ones that are considered direct. So these are the ones that your company is doing a thing. It's often burning or combusting uh, the fossil fuel and actually releasing physically the emissions into the atmosphere. So again, think of this as gas in company cars, heating oil or natural gas to fuel building systems, propane or diesel in company owned equipment or vehicles, 
Essentially, if your company pays the fuel bill directly or owns the asset, you likely have scope one emissions. And so a good way to remember this is burn. Now, we, we do these education webinars every so often, and I'm going to add a caveat here because I do think that we're all getting a little bit more knowledgeable and sophisticated about this. And so I want to add a little parentheses with the burn. It's not just burn in scope one. So also in scope one, again, remembering that these are the direct emissions, include things like chemical releases. So if you utilize refrigerants or fire suppressants or chemical processes where there's some direct off-gassing of chemicals into the atmosphere, those are also technically scope one. It doesn't fit quite as cleanly into the burn by beyond, but it is important to mention here. Another one that's important is specific for land use sectors. So think agriculture, forestry, scope one emissions can also include things related to land use change. So if you're cutting down trees, if you're changing soil composition, if you have livestock, things like that. Okay. But I think for the shorthand, if you're just starting out, let's go with burn. It's a very helpful tool to help remember. All right, now we go back to easy stuff. Scope two, buy. I happen to think this is the easiest of all the emissions to really wrap your head around. So scope two means any time that your company consumes energy, but that energy is produced elsewhere. And the easiest example of this is electricity, right? You flip on a switch, the lights are on, the equipment is running, and there's emissions associated with the consumption of that electricity, but your company didn't create that electricity. It was actually generated at a power plant, right? And so it's also, this is a question we always get that yes, the power plant created that electricity. Let's say it's really old school. It used coal. So their scope one emissions of actually burning the coal to create electricity is a, is a portion of your scope two emissions because you are then consuming a portion of that very same electricity. And that's okay. Carbon accounting is not about um, identifying or like identifying the concentration of emissions in the atmosphere. We do that with actual atmospheric testing, with actual testing. Um, what carbon accounting is about is accountability and identifying whose actions and activities are responsible for emissions. And in that case, it's both, right? It's both the power plant that burnt the coal to create the electricity, as well as the company that consumed the electricity. Okay, so other examples of scope two outside of purchase electricity includes other energy you might purchase, like steam, heating, or cooling capacity. Okay, now we're going to go on to the big kahuna, scope three. This is the fun one. So scope three is quite nebulous. This, in, this reflects all of the activities, both upstream and downstream, throughout your value chain. So scope three, three is everything that your vendors and suppliers, customers, and employees do to support your business. And these get broken out across upstream and downstream, and it's actually not consistent across those classifications. So you may notice here on upstream and downstream, leased assets is listed in both of those categories. And that be because it depends what um, part of that activity and relationship your company sits on. So for example, leased assets is a really easy one. Most companies lease office space, right? Physical space. If you are the building owner and the landlord in that dynamic, that's a scope three downstream because you are leasing the asset that's part of your sold good or service. You're leasing it out to a tenant. But if you're the tenant, if you're the company that's leasing space, that's an upstream leased asset because you are, of course, acquiring or leasing that space. So that's scope three. There are 15 categories, oops, sorry. There are 15 categories of scope three emissions and they are typically make up 90% of any company's emissions inventory. And that's a lot. Big challenge with scope three is that because this information and these activities happen outside of your operational boundary, it's really hard to get the data because it's not your activity. It's not your operation. You are reliant on information from your supply chain, from your vendors, from your customers, from the use of your product, et cetera. So let's just walk through an example here of how a company might go about putting together their first emissions inventory. And so let's take, for example, something like a t-shirt manufacturer. So you're going to start, companies always say, well, if scope three is 90% of my emissions inventory, is that where I should start? And I think that's a great, very ambitious question or even goal to have. But the truth is most companies start with scope one and two because those are emissions related to the energy you consume. And that is data that is readily available, right? You pay a fuel bill, you pay an energy bill, you often have sub-metered or measured energy 
And so oftentimes, if let's say we're back to the t-shirt manufacturer, where are they going to start? They'll probably start looking for those energy-related emissions. So scope one, perhaps they're burning natural gas to heat or power equipment if they own their own manufacturing facility. Perhaps they're burning propane and other equipment, or they have a fleet of company cars, they're burning diesel or gasoline. That's where they're going to start, right? And then, of course, with their scope two as well, the electricity they're consuming. Let's say they're purchasing steam to, to fuel some of the equipment in their manufacturing facility. And that's great. But again, that's only going to capture a small slice of the pie. So where might they also they focus? If we use the t-shirt manufacturing example, they could include emissions from everything from harvesting and processing the fibers that are used in a cotton base to make their t-shirts. That's an upstream scope three emission. For those that are familiar with greenhouse gas protocol, we're talking scope three, category one, purchase goods and service because they're buying that physical good. Let's say they could they could focus on transit miles to actually deliver the material that they use in the base of their products to the factory. And then even before the point of sale to deliver those t-shirts um, out to distribution centers. That's an example of an upstream scope three. That's technically category four, transportation and distribution. And then if we look at the other side, let's look at downstream, something like at the end of its useful life, the emissions that come from that t-shirt breaking down in a landfill when it gets discarded. That's a downstream emission for those GHGP folks on the line, scope three, category 12, end of life treatment. And so there's a whole framework, I've mentioned greenhouse gas protocol a couple of times now, that walks corporates through what these categories are, how to collect activity data for it. It's quite nuanced, it's quite complicated, and frankly, that's what we've done at Sustain Life is we've taken this protocol and we've productized it into an easy to use software so that you don't have to be the expert in the greenhouse gas protocol. You just have to know information about your business and all that translation into the scopes, into the emissions, into the constituent gases, technology can do that for you. Okay. So one other thing I wanted to say is, especially when it comes to scope three, but in any emissions inventory, don't let perfect be the enemy of good when it comes to carbon accounting. You're not going to have all of the data, you know, and you're certainly in your first year, but even in your 10th year. And the goal in carbon accounting and in putting together emissions inventories is to balance completeness with accuracy. So you might be starting with estimates and refining those numbers to be more specific and accurate and reflective of your business and value chain for those scope three emissions. Um, and so just important to say that I know it can seem daunting. It can seem like a lot. We want to simplify it for you. And hopefully we've done that, but to definitely, you know, not let perfect be the enemy of good. And so just a couple, a couple minutes here on some of the companies that we're helping. And hopefully this resonates to folks on the line here. You know, we, we often see companies come in these two buckets, some that are driven by regulation in the U.S. and beyond, often public or large enterprises that need a holistic carbon accounting solution. They're looking for those full scope one, two, and three. They're looking to set science-based targets. They need to report across various frameworks, and they're looking for a central data dashboard and interface that can manage all of that data for them, automate with integrations, and take a lot of the onerous need of um, all of this work off their plates. We also work with a lot of supply chain companies and those value chain companies, a lot of the small and medium-sized enterprises that are within the supply chain of Fortune 1000s. And for there, you know, oftentimes it's companies that are not sustainability experts. I think I'll talk about this in the next slide, but it's often procurement or logistics or operations, oftentimes finance. And they're looking to essentially respond to their most important customer requests with integrity, with an understanding. This is what our emissions are. This is what it represents. Here's where we estimated. Here's what it doesn't represent. And so that they can show improvement both in their measurement methodology as well as the actual decarbonization year over year. And so who we help today, again, just in terms of teams, and I'm sure there are some of you on the line, oftentimes it is an ESG team, right? A lot of those larger companies, they do have chief sustainability officers and sustainability teams that are directly responsible for steering a company's sustainability initiatives. But oftentimes it's not those teams. We are increasingly working with finance teams that roll up either within the CFO's office or roll up into that team. And they're approaching this oftentimes from a, a mandated disclosure or just a, a financial disclosure audit perspective, but on essentially incorporating emissions data and sustainability data into their 
reporting for non-financial or integrated reporting. And that's a trend that we're seeing a lot across companies. And then oftentimes, again, it's that procurement, it's that logistics, someone in operations that is deep within the business, deep within that material supply chain, and is the best kind of representative to, to be leading emissions when you don't have a dedicated sustainability team. And I guess I'll leave with just that one statement that this is something that we see all the time across our customer base and certainly out in the industry at large that you don't have to have a sustainability degree to work in this field. And I think that's an increasing kind of pattern and trend that we've seen that companies need to understand this information. It is material to their core business. It is material to their long-term strategy and resilience and really integrating the sustainability domain across all different job functions. And so in that, we're seeing a huge plethora of just new brain power and different points of view and discipline come coming into this field. So that's what we had to prepared for you today on Carbon Accounting 101 and how to put together an emissions inventory. We can drop a link here if you do want to see a walkthrough of our product. We didn't want to jam it in as much as I want to be able to show it to you. We can post a link here that is a guided walkthrough of the product so you can get a look and sense and feel and see a lot of the terms and kind of organizational structure that we talked about today. If you are a company that is looking to looking for technology solutions and support to put together an inventory, I encourage you to reach out to our sales team as well for a demo. That's sustain.life slash demo. Um, and now I think we actually have a solid amount of time for questions. So let me open up the Q&A function and I'll see what has come in here. And thank you all again for joining us. Okay, let's see. Okay, great. So a couple of really good ones here. I'm going to try to choose some that are maybe the most global. And we had also actually received some before. So let me also pull up those because I remember there were some really good ones in here as well. Okay, so one of them was ideas for a small business with minimal scope one and two emissions to start tackling scope three emission tracking. That's a great question. I love that you've asked it. That's one that we identify with very closely at Sustain Life because that's who we are. We are a small business. We are a fully remote business and we have actually no scope one and two emissions, not even very limited. We don't have any. We don't occupy any physical space or assets. And so if, if that is your company structure as well, the best place to start for scope three, what we did in our own experience as well is do a spend-based screening for your purchase goods and services. So when you're looking for those scope three hotspots to identify where are the big emissions in my supply chain, the way that companies often start is what's called a spend-based proxy. So all you do is, and we have, of course, a tool to support this in sustained life, but you're taking your transactional level data. So this could be an export from your accounting or your ERP system that just has where you're spending your money over the course of the year. And there's a process in which you can map the vendors or really purchase commodity categories of where you spend your money. And it runs through a very beefy model that essentially can pull emissions outputs out of that based off of the economic and environmental activity that, that goes within it. It's run by the EPA. It's a very cool model. But that's where oftentimes where companies start. And the benefit of this is Generally, companies have their expense data, right? You know where you're spending your money, you're paying your bills, you have an accounting team. And so that's where most companies start. And it gives you an amazing hotspot to understand, wow, these are the top vendors of where my emissions are coming from. These are the top commodity or purchase categories. You know, wow, we really spend a lot on digital IT and infrastructure, or we're really spending, you know, we have a lot of emissions from professional services. And so it's really helpful to direct where you're going to spend more effort, more deeply engaging in your supply chain to actually get primary data that actually reflects your specific vendors and your specific activities. A limit of that, of course, is that it is spend-based and so it relies on how much money you're spending. And so that's why what we promote at Sustain Life is the idea of going from that spend-based proxy information towards what's called like actually reported and measured and allocated emissions from your suppliers. So do the spend base, understand where are my biggest hotspots, and that gives you the direction to know where you want to engage in your supply chain to actually 
request or otherwise kind of get reported emissions from your actual suppliers so that you can make informed decisions about who you do business with. That's been part of our own process, frankly, and how a lot of small companies, when they think of setting even a science-based target, if you can't set a scope one and two target, are often setting those scope three engagement targets for SBTI, where they're making strategic and intentional decisions to engage with suppliers that have themselves set validated SBTs, science-based targets. Great question. Okay, let's see. Got another one here on how to handle estimating emissions for locations that lack historic data. That's another great question. This is one that we see a lot. We actually have a tool that we give to, to our uh, customers that is basically an estimation hierarchy of if you don't have data, here are the different ways that you can fill in those gaps based off of a hierarchy of what's kind of best. So let's say, for example, you have offices across the U.S., across regions, and you know, you're in the Southwest, you're in the Northeast, you know, across the country, but some of the locations you have no data. You aren't directly metered yourself. Your landlord hadn't given you any data. You have no historic data. How might you put an estimate together? Well, a great way to do that actually is to look at the data that you do have from your, from the rest of your kind of portfolio or, or occupancy in those other offices and calculate what's called an EUI or an energy use intensity. So look, and it could be specific to a region, it could be across your portfolio, it kind of depends where you have the data for, but you could actually say, okay, here's much energy, how much energy I'm using on average across our offices. We don't have data for these other ones. We'll use this as a proxy to say per square foot, and it's this many square foot, here's our energy consumption, and here's the resulting emissions. That's a really great way to do that. There is a whole hierarchy. You can also use industry average data. It's a little less specific to you. But again, let's say you don't have any of that other data to kind of fill in and inform a, a specific proxy. There's industry average data sets that you can use out well. If you have more questions about that, definitely reach out to us. We have the tool. It's, it's a really valuable one. And it, it really helps with those kind of data filling and estimates. And again, that's what we were talking about in really balancing the need for completeness because you do want to report your emissions but with the practicality and, and pragmatic ability to actually get real data, it's balancing completeness with precision. Okay, another great one here. And these are really great questions. These are um, to like technically challenging ones to understand and really just indicative of, of, of where a lot of companies are in really figuring this out. So how do you establish the boundaries that are organizational and operational before carbon accounting? So we actually have a, a module also in the platform that helps businesses identify what consolidation approach that they want to use, which has to do with organizationally, what are you responsible for? And so this is something I actually think this is the hardest thing in, in carbon accounting is the very first step of identifying your boundaries. Corporate structure is really complicated. There are subsidiaries, there are JVs, there are all different kinds of ownership structures. And the way that you reflect the emissions from all of those complex companies and partnerships and entities that your company might have a stake in is, is part of a broader concept in carbon accounting called consolidation approach. And oftentimes you'll want to talk to your finance team because the way that they reconcile this on their financial statements is how you'll want to recognize this in carbon accounting. And the important thing here is to be consistent. There's different ways to do it. I won't get into too much. But just know that there is guidance out there. We have a whole module in Sustained Life that helps you decide and understand what boundaries do I want to choose. And for anyone looking for support with carbon accounting, that's a really important thing, whether you're working with a consultant, whether you're looking for a tech platform, is make sure that they can help you do that because it is the foundational first thing you'll start with in carbon accounting. And it's a really important one to get right. Okay, let's see. Ooh, best sources of emission factors in different regions. Great question. So we didn't even talk about emissions factors. That's a great addition maybe that we'll have to add into the, the Carbon Accounting 101 primer. But what an emission factor is, is a factor that translates a business activity into an emissions output. So for example, consuming a kilowatt hour of electricity has an emissions output. And it's actually different depending on where that electricity comes from, right? Because grids have different mixes. If you're in coal country in the U.S., as an example, your local grid probably has a lot more coal and fossil fuels in it compared to renewables. And so the emission factor for that local grid is going to be different than, let's say, if you're um, in Texas or California or an area where the local grid has a lot of uh, renewables in its mix. And so 
That's the idea of what an emission factor is. And where do you get them is there's data sets with emissions factors and there's all different data sets depending on which activity you are trying to calculate. So there's different data sets for specifically electricity on an international scale compared to waste generation if you are putting plastic in a landfill or metal recycling. And that's the job, frankly, of your carbon accounting partner. And that is so much of why I advocate for companies to seek help here because your job is to run your business and to drive sustainability initiatives and to build these programs. It shouldn't be to keep track of which emissions factors you know, are being published and you want to use and all the different data sets. That's the specialty of carbon accounting support. And so that's what we do, of course, at Sustain Life. We have dozens of different data sets and thousands of different emissions factors in our platform that are regionally based and proximal to wherever your operations are. And again, specific to the activity that you're, that you're looking to do the carbon accounting calculation for. Okay, great. Let's see here. Let's see, I think we have time for one more. Really good questions. Actually, I think we got to a lot of these. Let me check some of these because I know we just have a couple minutes. Okay, do you foresee a future where companies of all sizes needing to attain the same standard of carbon accounting as a publicly traded company? Great question. This is maybe a subjective one, but yeah, I do. I think the writing is on the wall. I think that right now, so much of this regulation, and I'll say Europe is, is leading in regulation and ambition. And so if you look to that as an indicator to the EU law, uh, the disclosure that's required under the CSRD, it's not for such large companies. You can be a pretty modestly small company. There's three criteria. I don't have it in front of me, but I think over 250 uh, employees, which is not a huge company, um, that is required to disclose. And so there's phased timelines. So, you know, the largest companies are being asked to disclose in 2025, and it kind of phases over time with smaller enterprises asked to disclose in 2028. But yes, I do see over time, every single company is going to need to understand their carbon data and their carbon impact the same way that they understand their financial data and their financial impact. And so, so yeah, I do think that that's coming. The regulation is there in some countries, you know, down to a certain size. And I do think that that's the future that we can expect to live in. Climate change is not just a problem of large companies. It's not just a problem large companies are going to experience. This is the new normal in ways that companies are expected to operate responsibly and resiliently, frankly, you know, to support our economy and, and, and all the activities therein. Let's see, another question. We have maybe time for one more. How accurate can organizations expect to get with their calculations if the majority of supply chain is not tracking their own footprint? Really, really, really great question. And that's the challenge of scope three, right? The short answer I'll give you is there are tools, there is technology that you can utilize to help extract information, create proxies, so that even if your specific suppliers aren't reporting, you can still understand based off of their industry and sector and general activities, generally what an estimate, an appropriate estimate for emissions would be. But that's a great question. Uh, and that's a very good example of don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, okay, we're right up to time here. Uh, I wanna thank everyone so much for joining us today. Thank you for your time. Uh, please reach out to us with any questions. Um, we're happy to show you more about our platform, hopefully answer any questions and make all of this easy for you. And um, we will see you next time. Everyone take care.